Welcome to the Deep Dive. Today, we're uh, digging into one of astronomy's really enduring mysteries, a genuine cold case, the wow signal. Right. It's the signal from nearly 50 years ago now, this incredibly powerful radio burst. And it's always been seen as like the best candidate for potential extraterrestrial intelligence, just this complete one off that researchers, especially SETI folks, have been puzzling over ever since. Exactly. It's this ultimate cosmic puzzle. And honestly, for decades, it just sort of hung there unexplained. But that's changing, isn't it? Because now there's analysis trying to connect this this historical blip to something happening now, or at least something we're observing now. Yes, specifically to a newly detected interstellar object, 3i Lass. So our mission for this deep dive is to explore that connection. We're synthesizing recent work, mostly stemming from Avi Loeb's analysis, looking at what it would mean. I mean, the implications if this object, 3i Lass, actually is the source of that signal from 77. It's quite a leap. We're going from history to astrophysics, looking at current observation plans, and even touching on, well, how we'd react. Cosmic diplomacy, almost. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. The signal itself, August 15th, 1977, Ohio State University's Big Ear Radio Telescope. Yeah. It's just listening, right? It's scanning the sky. And then, bam, this incredibly strong, very specific, narrowband radio signal pops up. And strong means... Well, how strong are we talking? We're talking really robust. Yeah. Uh, the intensity was measured between 54 and 212 Jansky. Okay, put that in context. A Jansky is tiny. Yeah. It is. So getting up over 200 Jansky from dump space, that's huge. It was unmistakable. A clear, short-lived event that just towered over the background noise. And it wasn't just loud noise. It was focused. You said narrow band. Yeah, contained within a bandwidth of only about 10 kilohertz. That's really tight. Which points away from natural sources, usually. Generally, yes. Natural cosmic radio sources tend to smear their energy out over much wider frequencies. A narrowband signal like this often suggests something artificial, something engineered. Okay, and the other big piece, the frequency. Uh, yes. Critically, it was measured at 1420.4556 megahertz, plus or minus a tiny margin, about 0 0.005 megahertz. That sounds familiar. That the hydrogen be... line, the 21 centimeter line. Right, the frequency of neutral hydrogen. Exactly, the hyperfine transition. It's like the universe's default frequency, the one everyone knows. Yeah. If you wanted to send a deliberate signal across space, you'd likely choose this one. It's like putting up a sign saying, we're here. And we know basic physics. Extensionality. And there was movement involved too, right? A Doppler shift? Yes, that's crucial. Okay. The signal was blue shifted. It was shifted to a slightly higher frequency, indicating the source was moving towards Earth. How fast? The calculation suggests about 10 kilometers per second relative to the local standard of rest, you know, the average motion of stars in our galactic neighborhood. Okay, so let's recap the wow signals profile mm. intense, narrow band, right on the hydrogen frequency, and coming towards us at roughly. 10 kilometers. That's the essence of it, a very specific fingerprint. Now, before we jump to three itlas, we should touch on these standard natural explanations people kicked around for years. What were they? Well, the main contender was always something involving hydrogen clouds, maybe a sudden brief brightening of the hydrogen line emission from an interstellar cloud. Triggered by what, though? Possibly some external event like a powerful transient radio burst from something like a magnetar, a highly magnetized neutron star letting off a flare, something energetic enough to light up the hydrogen momentarily as it passed through. Okay, so a, a natural, if somewhat contrived, possibility existed. But we have that specific location from 77, right? Ascension 19 hours, 25 minutes, declination minus 27 degrees. That's the spot on the map where Big Ear was pointing. That's our starting point for this new analysis. Right. Now, fast forward almost 50 years, enter 3i Atlas. Let's clarify the name first, 3i. Simple enough, it just means it's the third interstellar object confirmed to be passing through our solar system. We had Umuola first, then 2 Aya Borisov, and now this one, 3i Atlas. And is it behaving strangely like Umuola did? Yeah. With that weird acceleration? Actually, no. That's one interesting thing about 3i Atlas. So far, it seems to be moving just as expected under gravity. No significant non-gravitational acceleration detected, unlike Oumuamua. It looks, for all intents and purposes, like a predictable gravitationally bound trajectory through the system. Okay, so let's do the time travel calculation. W wind back the orbit of 3i Atlas. Where was it in the sky on August 15th, 1977, when the wow signal arrived? Okay, doing the math, based on its current trajectory, 3i Atlas back then was at right ascension, 19 hours, 40 minutes, and declination minus 19 degrees. Wait, let me compare that. 
Wow. Was RA in 19 hours, 25 meters, DNET is 27. Eight day last was RA in 19 hours, 40 meters, DNET in 19. You see it? That's really close. How close are we talking in terms of degree? What about four degrees difference in right ascension and eight degrees in declination. That seems incredibly close for two random points in the sky, especially given the time gap. It is incredibly close. Statistically speaking, the chance of two random directions on the celestial sphere aligning that well is tiny. Roughly 0.6%. Less than a 1% chance. Yeah. So while it's not definitive proof, of course, it's statistically very suggestive. It's a kind of coincidence that makes scientists sit up and say, okay, we need to look deeper here. You can't just dismiss that alignment easily. Okay, the location is compelling, but let's talk practicality. If 3i NLS was the source back in 77, how far away was it? And what kind of power are we implying? Right. In August 77, based on its orbit, 3i last would have been about 600 astronomical units away. So 600 times the Earth's sun distance. That's really far out there, deep space. Very far. And if you calculate the transmitter power needed to produce the wow. signal's observed intensity from that distance, mm -hmm. well, you need something serious. How serious? We're talking somewhere in the range of 0.5 to 2 gigawatts. Gigawatts, as in like a nuclear power plant's output. Pretty much, yeah. Similar right. scale to a typical nuclear reactor on Earth. Mm -hmm. And that power would need to be focused, likely beamed, towards us. Okay, that definitely shifts the conversation. That's not a stray cosmic burp. That implies deliberate engineering. Serious technology. Yeah, it really does. It suggests a powerful, directed transmission using that very specific hydrogen frequency. Very hard to explain naturally at that power level and distance. But... And there's always a but in science, isn't there? There usually is. The velocity. We established the... Wow. Signal showed a blue shift, indicating about 10 kilometers per second approach speed. What was 3 Atlas's approach speed towards the sun back then? Ah, uh, yes. That's the major sticking point. The orbital calculations show 3 Atlas was approaching the inner solar system, yes, but at a much higher speed. Yeah. Around 60 kilometers per second. 60 compared to 10. 60 compared to 10. That's the critical velocity mismatch. That's a big difference, a factor of six. How can we square that? Doesn't that just kill the connection right there? The location matches, but the speed is way off. It's a huge caveat, absolutely. Yeah. And scientifically, you can't just ignore it. It's the weakest part of the hypothesis. So why pursue it if the kinematics are wrong? Well, partly because the spatial alignment is so statistically unlikely, that 0.6% figure. It forces you to at least consider explanations for the velocity difference. Like what? Measurement error. That's one possibility. Perhaps the original wow. signal blue shift measurement had larger uncertainties than documented. Or maybe the 10 kilometers isn't the speed of the main object itself. What do you mean? Perhaps the main body of 3i Ilus was moving at 60 kilometers, but the transmitter, maybe a probe or component on it, was moving relative to the main body or moving within some larger structure. So the transmitter itself had a different relative velocity. It's speculative, of course. But the idea is that the bulk object moves at 60 kilometers, but the signal source on it had its own 10 kilometers velocity relative to us, perhaps due to internal motion or emission dynamics we don't understand. It's a way to reconcile the numbers, even if it adds complexity. Hmm. Okay. So the location match is strong enough that we're willing to entertain complex explanations for the speed difference. Essentially, yes. The alignment is too good to just drop without further investigation. Which brings us to the present day. We have to look at 3 i loss now. See if it's transmitting anything currently, especially around that hydrogen frequency. Absolutely. That's the immediate goal. The spatial coincidence, however tentative, provides strong motivation for radio astronomers to point their telescopes at 3 i ILS and listen very carefully around 1420 megahertz. Has anyone done that yet? Reported any data? Surprisingly, not much public data, yet specifically targeting that frequency with high sensitivity for this object. Yeah. There's a real need for dedicated observations. But that's about to change, right? There are observation campaigns planned. Yes, thankfully. The astronomical community is gearing up. There's some key windows coming up where we can get a much closer look using spacecraft. When should we be watching for news? What are the key dates? Okay, the first really big opportunity is next year, 2025. Specifically, October 1st through 7th. What happens then? 3ILS makes a relatively close pass by Mars within about 29 million kilometers. Close enough for Mars orbiters to see it. Exactly. NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and ESA's Mars Express and the ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter. They'll all be in a prime position to observe it. That could give us unprecedented data, maybe even resolve some physical details. A Mars flyby observation. Cool. Any other windows? Yes. Shortly after that, November 2nd through 25th, also in 2025. 
ESA's JUICE mission, the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, will be able to train its instruments on three ILAs as well. JUICE has a lot of sensitive gear, right? It does. Spectrometers, cameras. Yeah. Designed for observing moons, but definitely capable of getting good data on an object like this. The goal is really to throw everything we have at it. Earth-based telescopes, space telescopes, planetary probes, maximize data collection. Okay, so the next couple of years are critical for gathering data on 3ILS. This leads us to the really big question, the one that goes beyond the science. What if? What if we do detect something? An artificial signal? Or maybe the Mars observations show it's clearly not just a rock or comet. How should humanity respond? Right. That shifts us into a whole different domain. Strategy, risk assessment, even philosophy, really. Yeah. Any potential engagement would need careful consideration, probably weighing the perceived nature of the objects. Avi Lowe proposed a scale, the lobe scale, for ranking potential encounters. How does that work? What's the dangerous end? A rank 10 on that scale would represent something posing an immediate, possibly existential threat. Think of it like an unknown visitor literally showing up on our doorstep. That would demand a rapid, decisive response. But even if it's not obviously hostile. Well, the argument is that even a low-ranked object, something seemingly inert, still warrants a contingency plan because the implications of any confirmed extraterrestrial technology are just enormous for humanity. You can't afford to be completely unprepared. This reminds me of the Trojan horse idea you mentioned. Exactly. Lubies uses that analogy. Could an object that looks like a natural comet or asteroid actually conceal something else, something unexpected, maybe even dangerous? If we just assume it's harmless because it looks inert from a distance, we could be taking a massive risk. We need verification. So, assuming we decide some kind of interaction is necessary, what are the options? What can we actually do? Broadly speaking, there are two main avenues considered. The first is communication, sending messages. Like hailing them on the radio. Essentially, yes. Uh -huh. Using electromagnetic signals, radio waves, maybe lasers to attempt contact. Similar to how the signal itself might have been sent, it's the passive long-range approach. Slow, given the distances. What's the alternative? Physical engagement. Actually sending something out there. Launching interceptor spacecraft. To do what? Blow it up? Not necessarily. More likely to get a close look. Missions designed to fly by closely, maybe even match trajectory to land on it if possible, or at least get high-resolution images to figure out what it really is. Determine its nature definitively. Okay, so messaging or sending probes. But either way, we hit that fundamental problem, communication itself. How do we even begin to talk to or even interpret something potentially completely alien? That's the crux of it, isn't it? Our entire understanding of the universe, of life, of technology is based only on our experience here on Earth. Our training data set, as Loeb puts it. Exactly. That data set is incredibly limited, confined to Earth-based physics and biology. What if an advanced civilization operates on principles we haven't even conceived of? How would we recognize their signals or understand their technology? It might be right in front of us, and we wouldn't even see it for what it is. Precisely. The analogy used is quite striking. Imagine an ant living in a crack in the pavement. It understands its world, the crack, the dirt, maybe other ants. Then a bicycle speeds past overhead. Utterly incomprehensible to the ant. Completely. The scale, the materials, the purpose. Mm. It's all outside the ant's reality. It's training data. Our attempts to communicate with or understand an interstellar object might be like that and trying to interpret the bicycle. We might just lack the fundamental concepts to even recognize what we're looking at. That really puts this whole deep dive into perspective. We started with this tantalizing signal from 1977, the WOW signal. Then we found this incredible spatial coincidence with the past position of 3i8 glass, that statistically improbable alignment. But it's all held back by that uncomfortable fact the velocity mismatch, the 10 kilometers versus 60 kilometers blue shift difference. And that tension is exactly why the upcoming observations in 2025 are so critical. Mm. We need to listen for current signals around the hydrogen line. We need to use JUICE and the Mars orbiters to figure out what 3 a 8 as physically is. So ultimately, this exploration forces us and you listening to think about our own limitations. If our interpretation of anything out there is inherently biased by our earthbound knowledge or limited training data. Yeah. What are we missing? What unconventional possibilities, maybe far stranger than just a simple radio signal or a solid object, are we failing to even recognize when we look at things like 3 ITLS? That's the thought to ponder long after this deep dive ends.